Okay, we were waiting for that. Uh, I'm glad to present, to introduce you to Luca Rossini, who is a colleague of mine. He's a tenure track uh, assistant professor of statistics at the University of Milan. Previously, he served as a lecturer at Queen Mary University. And bef even before that, uh, now I'm getting the pronunciation wrong for sure, uh, he served as a postdoctoral fellow at Free University in Amsterdam. Uh, his research interests are at the intersection of statistics and uh, uh, econometrics. Uh, in fact, he has published in leading journals, uh, both in statistics and econometrics, such as JBES, International Journal of Forecasting, and uh, um, Journal of the Royal Statistical Society. Uh, his research interests are in Bayesian methods uh, with application to time series and network theory. And today he's going to present the part of his work that deals with the application to the electricity market. Luca, the floor is yours. Okay, thank you. Thank you very much. Oh. Okay, thank you very much, Andrea, for introducing me and for inviting me here. So I'm glad to be here. And uh, what I'm going to present today is uh, my research a little bit about renewable energy sources. So it's something that has already been published, but I think it's already something that is of interest for all of us because there is a strong interest nowadays within the russian ukrainian war nowadays in the covid 19 pandemic that is bringing us attention to renewable energy sources so uh, myself and francesco uh, angelica and myself uh, were working till 2019 when i just finished my phd uh, in, in in venice we start working within renewable energy sources and we start seeing that it is interesting to have them on board of uh, time series methods. So the talk of today, okay, is based on these different kind of uh, of papers. So it's a little bit of a list of what I will present today. So they are all co-author with uh, Francesco Rabazzola and, and Angelica Gianfreda, and uh, uh, they are a little bit. Uh, they are linked all of them except the last one. Uh, to renewable energy sources. So it's trying to see if the introduction of having energy so renewable energy sources like wind, solar, and demand, uh, if they're important or not for forecasting uh, the electricity prices. And what we are trying to do it is, we are trying to work in from an hourly perspective. And the issue is that when you're working, we will see later on also during the talk, is that when one is working within hourly data, the problem is that you start increasing the dimensionality of your data. Why? Because if you think about the day, it's made by 24 hours. So we're going to be collecting 24 hours for each day. And when you're doing a sort of multivariate time series, what you will have, you will have your uh, response variable that is made by 24 uh, uh, hours times your, your times, obviously. But then what you will have it is, you will have also some exogenous variable that can be the length. So what is your length? Uh, what is happening yesterday to your electricity prices, but then also what happens to your forecasting wind and forecasting solar. And if you start looking, you have 24, 24 hours for the electricity prices, 24 hours for the solar, 24 hours for the wind. So you start increasing a lot the dimensionality of your of your metrics that you want to estimate. And that is also something interesting from from the statistical point of view and from the from the econometric point of view, despite the part of the of the empirical part and the application part there. And then there is also the nice feature in the paper that we have with, with, with Fabrizio Durante too, to look at the possible uh, relationship, let's say the dependence between renewable energy sources and electricity prices, despite the fact of forecasting. So what does it mean looking at the copula models? So try to look if you can have some sort of relationship also between the uh, the wind and the solar, and not only the price against the solar, the price against the wind, and so on and so forth. And the last one, it was a really long trip that we have with, with Claudia and, and Francesco, and we will start thinking about, okay, just forget for a while about the renewable energy source, see what's happening if you just try to look at other variables that might be of interest for the electricity prices. And it's something that we saw it can be relevant to what's happening today within the the Russian Ukrainian war of the uh, and the COVID-19 pandemic that electricity prices are influenced by the or are or can can be influenced by some macroeconomic variables so like industrial production index or or 
or a survey from, from the EMI and so on and so forth. So that's mainly what the talk will be, what the next hour, let's say, we will pass through all the time and we will try to discuss. So I don't know if you usually when you have when when I'm doing presenting, let's say I'm saying that if you have questions, feel free to interrupt me. I don't know if you can do this way around also here. Otherwise, we can just postpone at the end. So that that's 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 up to you. So so that's mainly the uh, the outline of the of the presentation. Obviously, when one is speaking about uh, the electricity prices, there is the fact is that electricity we know for sure, and I'm not the one that is here for trying to convince you. Let's say is that the electricity is something that is not partial, that is known or just like partiable, storable uh, commodity. And so what, what is going to be happening is that it's really hard, let's say, maybe nowadays is, is, is coming up a little bit to try to store the electricity prices, but it's really hard to store it. And on the other way around, when we start working within the uh, uh, this this sort of literature, we start seeing that uh, renewable energy sources are are becoming important for the uh, for for the for for the electricity prices by their own, and this is as two different kind of effects that you that you can see here. So, so the fact is that the uh, the the equilibrium prices, let's say, on on that scenario, there is is can be lowered, let's say, due to the fact that the rest, I will call it renewable energy or rest through all the, the part of the talk there, uh, because they're entering the, the supply curve before other more constant technology are coming and coming here. And thus, what is happening is that your, your supply curve is going to be moving and shifting from there. And this one is coming up not for the Italian situation, as you may know, but for example, from other countries like Denmark and, and Germany, as we will see later on within some graphs, that it can come up to have some negative prices. In Italy, it cannot up, it's not happening because we have some sort of uh, price cap below that, that the price cannot be negative. They can just arrive until zero. While for the German for the German market and for the Myanmar market, the one that we are looking at, we have the fact that the prices can also become, the price of the electricity can become uh, uh, negative. And it's happening when you have some huge amount of uh, forecasting wind, forecasting solar, that is coming up and, and is, is, is entering inside, inside the market there. And on the other way around, there is another point that is also that the rest try to add some sort of uh, complexity inside the market because they have a lot of variability, a lot of volatility inside there. And, and they're also a little bit hard and, and, and difficult to, uh, to, to predict because they are having some issues related also to the weather condition. If it's, if it's raining or if it's, a, if it's windy or, well, windy, it's working really well. The wind, the forecasting wind, but if it's raining, it's not so well within the forecasting, the, the solar part and so on and so forth. So that's one of the part of the, of the motivation. And then secondly, the most interesting part from my side, because I'm more, an, as, as Andrea was stating, I'm more an econometrician, I'm more a statistician, let's say, so I would like to also have a look at the model by its own, not only at the, at the empirical part. The thing is that uh, when we start working within the electricity prices, what was happening is that the literature was only focused on univariate model. So I don't know if you're familiar with univariate model, but the univariate model are the simplest model as possible that one can see. So like a linear regression model, maybe all of you know what is a linear regression model. Univariate model is the same, despite the fact that you are working within time series there. And what is happening is that you were, the, the literature, let's say, what it was doing, it was doing within, uh, they were modeling each individual hours of the day independently from the other. And they were not taking care of the cross time dependence. There was a couple of paper by, by Florian Zeal and, and Maciekowski and Otoraski in 2016. They were trying to see that uh, the prices uh, for early morning try to depend more on the latest information contained in the, in, in the previous day. And so what is coming up to, 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 to our mind that we were discussing within, within Francesco and, and Angelica, it was the fact that why and how one can deal it within this sort of cross hourly dependence. So the nice, the, the easy way, let's say, that one can think is, okay, I'm working within a univariate model and I, I'm adding some sort of exogenous variable inside that are just taking care of the other hours that you can solve it really easy. Yeah, that's kind of working, but 
on the other way around, when you work within a univariate model, you don't have a variance covariance matrix, but you just have one variance. So you just don't, don't look at the correlation, let's say, across the hours. And so what is coming up to, to, to our mind, let's say, it was, okay, why we don't work within the multivariate specification? So try to merge all together the 24 hours and see what's happening there. So that's mainly the main idea that is coming up from the contribution and that we will see through the next uh, 15 minutes, more or less, of, of the talk there. So what we will try to do it is, is the following is, we are gonna be looking at some multivariate uh, settings there where we are taking care of different kind of fundamental drivers that are, that are available in the literature, such that uh, forecasting wind, forecasting solar and forecasting demand. Then another things that we were also adding there is some uh, like usual uh, fuels like the, uh, uh, the the CO2, the coal, and, and, and the oil there. And and what we are interesting, let's say, initially, in one of the first papers that we got published, the IJF paper, the International Journal of Forecasting paper, we we're just taking care of just the constant volatility. So forgetting about having some sort of uh, variance covariance methods or, or the variance that is moving, but you just have it that is equal for time. So you don't care about any sort of variation there. And what we see in that starting paper is that if you start including the rest inside your model, you can see that your forecasting is improving a lot with respect to not adding rest when you want to forecast the, the hourly electricity price. And this one is changing through not all the hours of the day. So I'm not here to say that that model is, is working well for all the hours of the day. Why? Because during night or during the early morning hours, so midnight one, two, until 8 a.m. in the morning. Solar, for example, is not produced at all, and the other one is not so much uh, so, so much produced, so they are not influencing too much the, uh, the, the forecasting of electricity price. So that's something that is not working correctly. But on the other way around, when the renewable energy sources are entering inside, inside the market and they are producing a lot, then the electricity prices start increasing in, in, the, the forecasting of electricity prices is improving a lot when you have them on board, of course. And this one was our our starting point, let's say, that we were that we were dealing with. And then the second point is that we were start thinking uh, uh, again with Francesco uh, when I, when I was moving to to Amsterdam too. It was okay. What's what's happening? That we just fixed the, the volatility. We don't have we we have our variance that is not moving at all for time. But what's happening? And it's important when you have your 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 volatility that is changing for time. So the the terms that you can see here, are the this time varying volatility part here is the part of having some sort of volatility that is changing for time. And it seems and why we decided to have that it on board is because based on the macroeconomic literature, uh, what is happening is that stochastic volatility or Garch model or whatever time varying volatility is improving a lot the forecasting of macroeconomic variance. So in our, in our mind, we said, okay, why we don't want to try to have time varying volatility? And one, one answer that we can have it is, is, is the following is, yes, you can have some improvement. The first one is, is it's okay. But then secondly, what is happening is that when you're working, I don't know if you're familiar, but when one is working with macroeconomic literature one, and is working within multivariate model, one should always keep a little bit of attention which is the first variable that you want to analyze if you want to do some impulse response function or whatever, because it depends a lot what is the ordering. But in this case, in this scenario here, it doesn't matter the order. It's important the ordering, but it's already defined by, by the market. Why? Because I'm, I cannot say that our 12 is coming before our one. No, because my, 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 clock, my, my smart watch is saying that 1 a.m. is coming before is coming before 2 a.m. is not changing when, when, I, when I want. And so this one is one of the advantages that we have it with respect to the macroeconomic literature. So we don't have this sort of problem of ordering that is coming up from the literature review because our variables are just time dependent. So we don't care about it. So, so we, do, we don't have that kind of problem there. And the last part here of this slide that maybe that is related to what I was saying before is the part of this really big and huge exogenous variable matrix. And I think it's something also that is is interesting for, for the literature by its own because when one is working within macro and 
or, or in general, is always working within really big data set when the Y is really big and then you don't have too much exogenous variable. On the other way around here is not our Y that is really huge. So our response variable, the daily electricity price is just 24 hours. So that's enough. If you look at it, you say, okay, it's not so big. It's, it's like a normal data set nowadays. Maybe in the 80s were really big, but nowadays with all the machine techniques learn, that we have it, 24 hours is really easy, easy data set that you can give to your bachelor or master students for doing a thesis there. On the other way around, when you start looking at this exogenous variable, it's where the dimensionality, as I said before, is really increasing. Because if you start thinking you have 24 hours for the lag of the electricity prices, then you have 24 hours for all the renewable energies that is going to be entering. And if you start thinking your exogenous variable X is really exploding and is really growing a lot. So that, that's mainly the point there. So that's, that's, the, that's the point. If you are getting bored, and if you fall asleep before the end of the seminar or of this talk, uh, I want to summarize a little bit the take home result that one can take. it. So if you want to leave the talk now, feel free. You have already your take home results. You can get, get home and say, okay, I'm fine. I solved it. And that's, that's all. What, is, what is this talk is giving me is this really nice result. And that's all. So in what, what we saw is the following is we start within constant volatility model. So no time varying volatility. And we saw that the results were really good. But then once we just putting inside the time varying volatility, we saw that we have a huge improvement in different countries. And in particular in the forecasting in Germany and in Denmark, while in Italy, this sort of improvement is not so strong. And one reason can be the fact that Germany and Denmark can go negative within the electricity prices, while Italy have this sort of lower bound that cannot go behind the, below zero there. And so that can be one of the reasons there that Italy is not, is not improving too much. And on the other way around, the fact is that I'm stating, and then we will see a little bit through some maths there, what I'm saying is that uh, stochastic volatility or whatever we want it as time varying volatility, one can think in to have some Gaussian, so the usual normal distribution, so no problem of head tails, no problem on your pets, but the thing is that What's happening if you, and in this case, when you have some sort of outliers, let's say, what's happened to your fat on, on, your, on your tails, let's say, sorry, on, on, your, on your tail part? And what we saw is that if you start increase, increasing, let's say, the, and start taking consideration the fat tail part, then you have some sort of strong improvement. And one analysis that we will see also later on is the fact that it's also interesting to not fix the degrees of freedom that you want it, but you want to estimate this. And the second part, the second nice feature that maybe is not written here, but you should trust me on my voice and then we will see later on, is the fact that this degrees of freedom is not the same for the 24 hours, but we're gonna be estimate the degrees of freedom that is changing for the hours. So what, what, what it does it mean? It means that you can have the degrees of freedom that is six or 20, so no problem of fat days, at one hour of the day, but on the other way around, on another hour of, of the day, you can have really strong and huge fat tails there. So that's mainly one of the other advantage of what we are, what we are doing and what we are trying to, to see today. And these one are the results. So that's a plot, let's say, it, or, or a slide related to the prices. And it's strictly related to what I was continuously telling you in the first 20 minutes of, of, of the talk, let's say. So the fact that, as you may see for the plot here, so you may see that on the left side, you have Germany, on the central side, you have Italy, on the right side, you have Denmark. And if you, if you allow me to look at the Y axis, what you can see is that Germany is going negative, Denmark is going negative, but what happened to Italy is not going negative. So it's strictly related to what I was telling you before, the lower bound for Italy there. So that's, that's something that is taking, and is important, let's say, for all the analysis that we are adding. So, taking care that Germany, Italy, Germany and Denmark can have negative prices, while Italy cannot, it cannot have that kind of negative values. And on the other way around, as I said, what we have, we have the hourly day ahead uh, prices, let's say, that are determined one hour, one day before the delivery on the, on the day ahead market from, from the different kind of power exchange uh, from, from, the, from the European countries. 
One thing that one can say, and I'm looking at this slide, is the following. Why are you stop in 2019 and you don't look at the, at the COVID-19 situation and the Russian-Ukraine war? Well, firstly, because the paper that, I, that, I'm, that is based on the talk on, they were referring to this kind of data. And secondly, and we will see also at the end of the talk, but I just want to, to pin out for all of you, is that when you start increasing your data set until now, within the Russian-Ukraine war and the, uh, and the COVID-19 situation, you can start having some problem of outliers. Why? Because you have these values that are exploding a lot, being really huge positive or really huge negative. It can happen for oils, but it can also happen for electricity prices. So the models that we are having here, they are not so good in that kind of direction. And so what it can, what it can happen is you, can, you need to model that kind of outliers. And it's a little bit more complicated than one can expect. You cannot just say, okay, that price is going to 300, okay, I'm waking up this morning, I just deleted that price and forget about it. I cannot do it. I need to start thinking about how to model that kind of outlier. Yeah. And the way is that there is different kind of literature that is coming up just a couple of, a couple of months ago. There is a paper on Restat by Massimiliano Marcellino and, and others, co-authors, that is start pointing out the possibility of working with this, VA, this multivariate model with stochastic volatility that is also analyzing the outlier part. So it's something that is really interesting, and we are still trying to explore a little bit with, with Francesco uh, through this part of literature, but unfortunately, I'm not able to have some really nice plots to show you in order to state, okay, that kind of model is working correctly there. So that, that's mainly the point why we just decided to stop uh, in 2019 and forget about the, uh, the COVID-19 situation and the, and the russian ukrainian war that is coming up. And, and obviously, what you can see here is that these prices is changing through the 24 hours. So this one is the flux plot, how it's changing the price across the 24 hours. But I think that the most interesting part across the 24 hours is related to this plot here that is related to the forecasting demand, the forecasting wind, and the forecasting solar there. This one is just straight related for Germany. You have data for, we, we have all the plots also for Italy and Denmark too. And the fact is that what you may see here is that in particular for the solar, you have a sort of, it seems like a belt here. If you think about the Gaussian distribution, if you look at the book, the Gaussian distribution is exactly looking at this plot here. Why? Because the solar during the night period and during the, 20, 20, the, the APM hours is not get produced in practice. It's really close to zero there. And, and the, the point is the following is, how one can deal it within this sort of zero, because they are exactly zero. They are not in a range of zero, so they are not really small numbers. And one of the nice tricks that we were having, that we were thought about with, uh, with, with our talks with Francesco, it was that we can do in some sort of uh, pre-process of these uh, values that are close to zero to try to detect this block of zero. Because if you have this block of zero, you can have some sort of multicollinearity problem when you're doing some sort of estimation. Why? Because you have some singularity problem and so on and so forth. And in this way around, if you want to dis detect this block of zeros, you can just add some sort of randomness that is close to zero in order to try to work within and not having any sort of uh, singularity or multicollinearity problem in the solar there. And, and then on the other way around, you can see also that you have some sort of variation in particularly for the demand through the hours of the day while for the wind here, the changing is not, is not so much influenced for the hours of the day. You have some off and on peaks, but it's not as evident as, as the, the forecasting solar there. And inside our analysis, we will also take care of some sentiment prices for the coal, for the natural gas, and for the CO2, just to be coherent and just to show that having or not having this, this, this sentiment prices on it's not improving too much that, that sort of forecasting, but it's better having these renewable sources on board of our model to have some, some strong improvement there. Okay, just start with a little bit of math, not too much math, I guess, today, based on the slides. This one is related to the fact that the literature was based on univariate model. So this one is the usual representation of a univariate model that you may see in all your books or all your papers that are dealing with univariate model. So the first point that the referee asks us, but in general, that people can ask by their own is the following. Why you want to go complicated? Why you want to go with the multivariate model 
why you can get really good results when working with the univariate model? That's a really good question. Why got complicated with the, why when with a good model, with a really easy model, you get the same results? And the answer is coming up in this and the next slide. So what we have done it in order to justify or in order to show you that running a univariate model is not so in, is, is not providing really good results with respect to running a multivariate model is the fact that we decided to run this 24 univariate model. So for each hour, we run it this model where you have this part here that are just the dummies variable for the month of the year. So you have 20, 12 variables for each one for each month. And then you have some variables that are taking care of the weekend, weekend seasonality. So one for the Saturdays, one for the Sundays, and one for the holidays. And why we take care of these dummies? Maybe I forget a little bit, but because we decided to work directly with the levels of the prices. So the goal of all our analysis is not working within any sort of transform data set. So what we want to do it is we want to let a little bit of data speak and not transform them. Because what we focus is that if we transform them, we can have some problem not detecting all the negative prices in Germany or in Denmark. And so that sort of transformation or standardization can, can allow us to have some sort of issues. And for that reason, and following a little bit of the literature, like uh, Kessler 2015 paper and so on and so forth, we're able to have some dummies variable on it. So that's 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 mainly the point. And I, I I really apologize if I'm not citing anyone, but if I would like to spend time for citing all the papers, I think that I will spend 10 or 15 slides for just citing all the papers. But is if you wanted to to look at the papers, we can have a talk later on, or I can I can share with you the the, the paper uh, that are referring to 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 all the literature. And then on the other way around, what we are dealing this part here is the part of the electricity prices left. So what does it mean? It means what's happening to the electricity prices yesterday, two days ago, seven days ago, and so on and so forth. So that's the part of the autoregressive part of the autoregressive model there. And then you have these alphas part here that are the free forecasting value that are changing to hours. So XT is the demand, WT is the wind, ZT is the solar. And then you, we decided to take care also of the fundamental drive, fundamental prices. So we had the one referring to coal, the one referring to natural gas, and the other one referring to CO2. And if I'm just stopping now, and if you don't look at the last part here within the summation here, that's a really easy AR model. So within some exogenous variable and so on and so forth. But the point is that in order to state that the multivariate model is a really good model, what we need to introduce also is this part here that is taking care of the legs, the first leg of all the other hours. So what does it mean? I'm interesting at 1 a.m., so at 2 a.m. today, I'm taking care of the 2 a.m. yesterday, two days ago, and so on and so forth. But then I'm also taking care of 1 a.m. of yesterday, of 2 p.m. of yesterday, and so on and so forth. So in this way around, we are trying to look at the sort of multivariate model in a universe specification. The only issue is that this epsilon here, that is the error term, is just like univariate. So it's just like a normal distribution, but you have just a mean that is just like one term, and the variance that is just like one variable at all, not a matrix at all. And this, I hope you can see this plot here, this heat map here, is the heat map that is showing you the residual series that are built up. So we build up, we try to build up a sort of variance covariance matrices from the univariate, the 24 hours univariate model there. I was, I was thinking that I was able to use, to zoom it on it, but I will, I'm not able to zoom it. You should trust me a little bit. If you have this huge blue part, let's say it seems that you are close to zero. If it's getting a red part, it seems that you're getting close to one and don't be, don't worry about the fact that the lower part is all of zero, but be just because you are looking at the upper triangular part. So you can just thinking that the, the lower part is exactly the same as the upper part. So that's only for, for, for the lower part. And what are the results, the take home result that you can have it from this heat map here? Despite the fact that it's really nice, you have these really nice colors. My daughters are really happy about looking at it. Red, yellow, and blue, and so on and so forth. That's really nice. But the fact is that what is happening here is that the uncorrelated residuals make the multivariate specification not necessary. So getting closer, getting blue, 
it means that you, using multivariate is not so good. And as you may see, it's only happening to some of this part here, really far away. But on the other way around, it seems that we have really, really huge correlation because it's really red, really uh, yellow. So in the meaning of 0 0.6, 0 0.7. So it means that using that kind of univariate model is not so good, but it's better moving to a VAR specification there to try to estimate uh, this covariance structure there. So that's for the starting point. So we decided to start in from the univariate model. And nowadays, what we start to say, OK, the univariate model is a good model, but it's not so good. So it's better moving to a multivariate one. And what is coming up to the multivariate model here is the following is similar let's say to the univariate model the part that is changing is this sigma part here this one is not just like one scalar but it's a matrix here and the fact is nowadays and this one is important and we will see later on this sigma in this sort of point here is not time dependent so it's just like constant volatility so this one is the meaning of a var or vector autoregressive model within p legs within constant volatility, not changing at all. And that in this point here, we don't have exogenous variable. We will see just like in the next sli slide, what's happening if you start putting the, the exogenous variable. And one thing is that in, I, I am, so let's say, the point is the following. Uh, I'm not a frequentist guy, I'm more a Bayesian. So my, my entire small career, let's say, is based on Bayesian. Uh, uh, statistics, let's say, and vision estimation. So all the models that we see from here until the end of the talk, they are only based on the Bayesian uh, estimation. There. So I don't know if you are familiar with Bayesian statistics or Bayesian econometrics or Bayesian inference. When you do in Bayesian inference, what you need to do it, you need to have a prior on your parameter, so on your B1, BP, and your sigma there, and then you need to build up your posterior distribution in order to find your estimation, your estimator, let's say, your maximum likelihood estimator, we can say. That's not completely correct there. And in order to have a prior distribution, what we stated is that in this really easy example, we just state an inverse Wisher distribution. Why? Because our sigma needs to take to be sem positive semi-definite. So one possible distribution can be the Wisher distribution there. And obviously, the title of the talk was Renewable Energy Source, the importance of renewable energy sources. And we need to have also rest inside that kind of model. And it's coming up here, inside your X tilde here, you have all your renewable energy sources and also your, uh, your, your uh, fundamental crisis there. So in practice, this one is the representation of the VAR X, let's say, where you have all your exogenous variable. This one is a vector, dt is a vector made by all the dummies that we saw from the univariate representation. This xt is written in bold, this wt and zt are written in bold. Why? Because these one are the forecasting wind, the forecasting solar and the forecasting demand for each hour. So it's a vector made by 24 hours for each of the variables there. And that, that was just for the VAR. Obviously, when we start, as, as I said at the beginning, when we were start thinking about constant volatility, then we state, okay, what's happening if you just start increasing and having time varying volatility? If you look at the previous talk, sorry, the previous slide, you were, I, I hope you can see my, my pointer here, you were having your sigma here, there was not having any subscript T here. But nowadays, what is entering here, you have some sort of subscript T there. So it's meaning that your variance covariance matrices or your volatility is time varying, so it's changing with time varying. So that's maybe the part, the, the novel part that is entering inside this model. So no more having the constant volatility, but you have some sort of time varying volatility there. You have some sort of uh, representation that I don't want to go too much on it. You can you can just try to reduce in a sort of let's say multivariate model, let's say. And the nice feature that we decided to have here is that we decided to have a sort of stochastic volatility representation that it can be in this way around. So a sort of random walk process there. 
So what does it mean? It means that the volatility today is depending on the volatility yesterday, plus a sort of error term there. One thinks that people, if they are doing financial, financial time series or whatever, can say that why you don't use some sort of GARCH model, the general, generalized autoregressive uh, conditional heteroscedasticity model, is the fact that in this explicit scenario here, the GARCH model seems not to work really, really fine because we are having really huge high, dimension, high dimensionality. And when you're going in high dimensionality, GARCH is not a really good model. And also because we saw, we, we tried and we saw that the estimation was not so, so really so easy, let's say, to have it and, and bring us to really good results there. And yeah. So, yeah. But the online. Okay, uh, okay, that's true. Uh, sorry, thanks. So, so just just to to understand which which are the elements of the vector y. That's just a clarification. Yeah, that, uh, that, that, that's a good point. So maybe I was going a little bit uh, quick on that part and faster. So this y is made by your 24 electricity prices, one for each hour. So this one is made by your day ahead electricity prices. So this one will be the first one will be 1 a.m for day t, then you have 2 a.m. for a t, 3 a.m. until 20, until midnight, let's say, for the day t. And it's gonna be changing for all the time there. No, no, t, uh, so the point is the following. So that, that that's a good point. What he was, what he was saying, maybe you were the one online, were not listening at, at you. This T here is the part related to the day part there. So what is changed, what, what you need to thinking about is the fact that your Y part is the hour. So these one are the 24 hours. These one are the 24 hours, but at the previous day. So this T here is the part related to time today, but inside you have all the 24 hours for that kind of day. Okay, so then another question. Yeah. So which, which is the intuition of why you need the, to, mo to jointly model all the price for every hour. I mean, the economic intuition, if you want to give an economic intuition. On this. So the point is the following, is that the first hour of, so in this case here, when you have the electricity prices, you can have that the hours of the day, and it's based also on this slide here, is the fact that you have some sort of correlation between the hours of the days. So the first hour can be influenced by the second hour of the same day or by the midnight hour or the 11 p.m. hour. So that's mainly the intuition behind. So that, that, that's mainly the point. And the fact is that in this, in this univariate representation, this one is just, you fix just one hour. So this model here is working just for one hour. So that's mainly the point. While on this way around, we are dealing also with all the hour together. So that, that's mainly the point. And you can see that you are interesting to look at the possible correlation across the hours there. I hope to, to answer. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah just just yeah. To, convi to convince that this is, a, I, I would also show the same uh, the, 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 uh, correlation matrix also you considering uh, other time frequency. I mean, that is the, the, rel the relevant time frequency that you have to, for which we have to study the structure so deeply is the one within day. You know, basically it is within day, no? It's, yeah. it's, so it's not, for instance, can be also within the week. I mean. Yeah, but the problem is that I, so within week, you have a really huge amount of variability inside the day. So the fact is that here, during some hours of the day, for example, for Italy, you have some, well, this one is just box plot, but you have some variation. Look at the outliers, how, how different are for the hours of the day. And the same is coming up from the, from, the, from the renewable energy sources here that are changing through the hours of the day. So the fact is that it's important working within hourly data, not within week, so the, the fact is that your T should be daily and not week, because otherwise you have you, how you can model how the change they are within the same hour. There. And the point is also that what we are looking here nowadays, for Italy, you don't have half hourly data, but for example, for Germany, you have 15 minutes hourly data. So what does it mean? It means that the, the hour is changing every 15 minutes. So nowadays that we just spoke for 40 minutes, the, the, the price has already changed three times. So it's really, so if you work within weekly, you get crazy and you miss a lot of variation that you have inside the same, the same 15 minutes.
So I hope to have to have answer to your to your comment there. Okay. Well, thank you very much. So, so coming back to to has. So let's just like I don't want to spend too much time to this prior specification. We can talk a little bit later on. This one is the usual Bayesian representation that one can have when one is dealing with the univariate when the, with the multivariate model. So the fact is that you need to take a prior on the initial states, take a prior on the state variance, and take a prior on all the parameters that you are dealing with. And these one are the usual prior specification that one can deal with when it's working within a VAR model with stochastic product. So the last point, and then if I remember correctly, we will just move to some more results so you are not get bored and we'll look at some tables and some plots there, is as I stated at the beginning when I was giving you the take home result, is the fact that you may also be interesting to include the part of the tails. So what's happening to your fat part? And what is gonna be happening is that you can model it through a student T error term inside the stochastic volatility. So what is changing is that your sigma t has some part on lambda there that is representing the part of the of the of the student t distribution. And when you have these degrees of freedom nu j, that as you may see is changing through the 24 hours, as I was saying. And we decided to take care of two different kinds of scenarios. So the first one is the, degree, the degrees of freedom can be estimated, so we don't take them fixed for all the 24 hours. And on the other way around, we decided to fix them to a degrees of freedom equal to five, that it was equal to the fat tails posterior mean over the 24 hours in order to see to what's happening there. So what is the difference between these two numbers here? The first one, your degrees of freedom, is different from our one, two, our three, four, five, and so on and so forth. In the second one, we have just one that is equal to five for all the 24 hours. So no matter what is your estimates and no matter what is happening there. So you just fix it equal to 24. So just to summarize these 41 minutes of talks that we have until now, what are the models that we're gonna be seeing until what we'll see later on? We'll see the model within constant volatility, the model within stochastic volatility, within exogenous variable and not exogenous variable, and the one when you estimate the degrees of freedom in fat tail scenario, and when you have the fixed degrees of freedom. So finally, we arrived to some results. Before looking exactly at all the plot, as, as, a, as an econometrician, as a time series person that is working within time series, you need to decide, you need to see what is the best model. And what you can do it is, you can see the Akaike information criteria, the IEC or the BIC, or on the other way around, there is this DV, the v, the BIC, let's say we can summarize it, uh, that is the uh, similar to the AIC, that is the sum of the posterior median mean deviance and the effective number of parameters that you want to estimate and indicates a sort of trade-off between the model fit and its complexity. And then another measure that we can use is a sort of base factor that is tell, telling you which is the best model across the one that you are going to be doing. And just to be sure, all the analysis that you will see until the part of forecasting is based on full sample analysis. So we run all the sample from the 2016 until the 2019, and we decided to include seven legs. And this part is important when you're dealing within the electricity passes. But is seven legs or thought is not seven legs? We have a huge discussion within the record of the papers because what we state, we state three legs or seven legs, but the fact is that we are taking care of seven legs, but only the previous day, so T minus one, what's happening yesterday, T minus two, so two days before, but then we forget about all the other electricity prices, and we just take a look at one week before. So let's say today is Tuesday, so what is happening is that we will take a look at the price yesterday, so Monday, the price two days ago, so Sunday, and then the price one week ago, so Tuesday the 24th of March then. So that's mainly the point. And we forget a little bit of all the other prices. Why? Because we see that based on the literature and based on our analysis that there is a sort of seasonality inside and the price of one week before is strictly influenced the price of, of today a little bit. But going also looking at all the others is just adding complexity to the model but not bringing any good results to what we are looking at. So, <clears throat> 
So if you look at, so looking at what is the best table, the mod, sorry, the best model, not the best table, the best model here across all the models for the different countries in, in an in-sample representation. So looking at all the sample, this table here, you should interpret in this way. We are comparing all these models here with respect to the benchmark model. The benchmark model or the baseline model for us is the VAR model, constant volatility, no exogenous variable. Easy model with only electricity prices and lagged electricity prices, nothing else. And we're going to be comparing that model with the model that is include stochastic that is include stochastic volatility or only exogenous variable X. If the value is less than one, it means that you are beating the benchmark. So in this case here, if you look at 0.7058, it means that you are beating the benchmark by more or less 24 percent, let's say. But on the other way around, you can compare across all the model, which is the best one. So the black, the bold part, I hope you can see. So this, for example, for Germany, this 0.722, it means that the model that is estimating the degrees of freedom and that is having a student distribution is the best model across all the model by using the base value. While on the other way around, for Italy, it's happening that if you fix the degrees of freedom, you have some sort of uh so some sort of better results and this one for italy in particular is strictly related again to the fact that for germany and for denmark you can go negative while for italy you have some sort of lower bound zero lower bound in action and so it's for that reason that maybe fixing the degrees of freedom is getting better results with respect to not fixing although if you look at the differences between this model and this model is not so huge it's really marginal but we need to look at the at the results there is not so it's in order to, if you look at the number, this one is the best model. And in the same way around, we can look also at the DIC. Another, oops, there is an error here in the slide. I apologize for it. If you're looking at the DIC here, this, it's, you look at this one, you don't compare with respect to the VAR, but, or you can do also a ratio, but in this way, you just look at the, at the, at the number as the yard, and the smallest is the best, one, or the one in dark is the best. One. And the values inside the bracket that you can see below are the standard error. Why? Because we, we run it, this DIC multiple times. So not only once, but we run it 10 times there. And what we can see is that, again, it's changing a little bit the best result because for Germany, for example, it's becoming that the best model is the one that you don't estimate the, the degrees of freedom, but it's not changing too much with respect to the one that is changing the degrees of freedom. So looking at the plot of the volatility, let's say, uh, I hope you can see this one is just related to four different hours of the three different hours of the day. So we focus on what's happening to 10 a.m. in the morning, what's happening to 2 p.m. in the afternoon, and what's happening to 6 p.m. So it seems that what's happening when rests are important but not too much, when rests are really important, and when rests are start getting important, 10 a.m. in the morning, let's say. And what you can see here is you have different kind of lines. So the, the red lines here is the model within the VARX. The black one is the one related to the stochastic volatility model. And the last one is related to the uh, student key representation. Model. And what you can see is that if you just introduce the part of the fat tails, so if you look at the gray representation here for early morning part and late evening part, you may see that in particular during winter period, so around January, or December and so on and so forth, you have some sort of reduce in the in the volatility there. And on the other way around, you have some sort of highest reduction during the 2 p.m. when is you have some sort of major uncertainty due, due to the fact of the combination of the error from the forecasting demand, uh, and forecasting wind, and forecasting solar generation. This one is another nice plot. It's related to the degrees of freedom. So if you have followed until, until now my, the presentation that we're having, when we were dealing within the fat tail representation, we're interesting also to estimate to the degrees of freedom. So how is changing through hours? We are not fixing to the same hours. And as you may see, this representation is for Germany. What you can see is that the degrees of freedom are changing a lot across the 24 hours. So you have some peaks during the next night period, well, they are not going really close to the normality because you are just in a range between uh, two and seven there. But it seems that during night period, 
you have a little bit highest degrees of freedom. So maybe you are getting more close to some sort of some sort of Gaussianity and, and, and normality there, while during oops, sorry, right here. While if you look at this part here during some 2 p.m. Uh, 12 a.m., 11 a.m., and so on and so forth, you have that the degrees of freedom are really, really low there. So this one is just to justify also the fact that we want to estimate the degrees of freedom and not fixing it equal to all the hours of the day. Just to, I don't want to go through the formulas here, but what is the goal, what it was the goal, it was also looking at the forecasting so try to forecast the, the, the electricity prices. What's happening one day ahead? So what's happening tomorrow to the electricity prices? So what, what, we are, what we need to do it, we need to fix a little bit of in sample. So this one is the in sample representation on which we are doing all the rolling part. And then what we are trying to do, we are gonna be forecasting from the 1st of January of 2018 until the December 2019. And we are using a sort of rolling window. So each time that we want to forecast a new value, we just move our window, but the size of the window is remaining the same, two year size there. We use two different kinds of forecasting, both point and density. I don't want to go through the formulas. The point forecasting is the root mean square error. It's just looking at the difference, let's say the square differences. And the density forecasting is more interesting because you're looking also how it's moving, not only the point, but all the density of your distribution there. Now this I will show you a couple of, of tables on the results, and you will see a lot of color, colors or different kind of, uh, of asterisks coming in, and I want to show you what does, they, what does they mean. So first thing is, if you see a value that is bigger than one, it means that you are not beating the benchmark, the VAR model, as we saw for the base factor. If it's less than one, then it means that the model that you are proposing is better than the other one. If you have a stars, coming up here, three, two, one stars, it means that we have done some sort of comparison, pairwise comparison with respect to the benchmark. And if you have a stars there, it means that your model is really good with respect to the benchmark. And then we run it also a model confidence set. So if you see some gray cell on it, it means that that model or that pair of model is the best model across all of them. So not only, no, it's not a pair comparison, but it's just all the model compared together. There. So, now you can look at that sort of thing. This is the table for the Germany. We just run it one horizon ahead. So we just want to estimate what's happening tomorrow for different hours of the day. We have run it for all the 24 hours. Putting a table for all the 24 hours is getting really a mess there. So I just focus on some hours of the day. So the first part of the table is in point forecasting and the second one is in density forecasting. And as you may see, one point is the following is, if you look at the first column here, it means 1 a.m. in the morning. 1 a.m. in the morning, it means that forecasting solar is no, it's nothing, is not coming in inside, and maybe also wind is not so important. And in fact, what is happening here is see, the values here are all bigger than one. So it means that if you're including uh, exogenous variable here inside, it's not improving your model. While if you start in increasing the hours of the day, you see that including the exogenous variable and adding also time variant volatility is bringing you some really good improvement. And this improvement really huge, why? Because if you look at them, oh, for example, in this case here for 1 p.m., 0.682, it means that I'm improving by more or less 31% uh, with respect to the benchmark. So it's really, it means that we have a really huge improvement by adding some constant volatility there inside the model. And then secondly, if you look, the gray cells that are coming up, the VAR model, the benchmark, it never gets included. Neither the model, when you have just constant volatility, is getting included. But including stochastic volatility, and in particular, the student with the fade tails, is being one of the best, is the best model across all the models from the confidence set part. The same is coming up from Italy. But the results are a little bit more different, let's say. Why? Because if you remember for Germany, the results were improvement of 30%, 31% more or less. While here, the improvement, if you look at the same hour as before, the improvement are just around 10%. Well, it's really good improvement, by the way, but not so strong as for Germany and for Denmark. 
And again, one of the problems can be due to the fact to the zero lower bound that you have for the Italian market. So that's mainly to, to, to conclude a little bit the part on, the, on, the, on, on Italy too. And this one is coming up for both point and SDK. Just a few, I have six minutes more or less, or something like that. Uh, what I want to show you and just to provide you a few highlights also on, on what it can happen also if you don't want to look at the, at the forecasting representation. So until now, in this hour of talk, I hope you not get bored, but in this hour, what we are seen, we are seen just to look at forecasting and having volatility or not inside the model. But as you, as you remember at the beginning of the talk, what we were looking at is also the possible interdependence or the relationship between the renewable energy sources within them or between the risk and the price. And what you can do it, and now you can do it, let's say, in order to model this dependence, you can use the copula models, which is an approach that is using statistics in multivariate statistics that allow you the separation of marginal components from the dependence structure there. And what we want to do it, what we will do it, we will try to capture the dependence at an hourly hours and looking at the dynamics there and try to look at this style dependence. And the nice feature that we are interesting is not only the relationship between prices again wind that has been done a thousand of times in the literature or price against solar, but also try to look what's happening across the two renewable sources. So what's happening, demand versus solar, demand versus wind, or wind versus solar then. And what we see, well, it was supposed to be bigger, this figure here, I hope you can see it, then these two plots here, at least the colors, I hope, they are looking at the pairwise correlation that is used by our wine copulas, a kind of copulas, between the prices and demand, or between prices and wind, or between prices and, and solar, and also the effect of the demand with respect to wind, and the demand with respect to solar, and demand with respect to, uh, to uh, sorry, and wind with respect to solar there. So if you look, for example, at this first plot here, if you look at the blue line here, this one is the, the, the correlation between what? Between demand and wind, while the first one is the correlation between price and demand, and the last one is the correlation between price and wind. And what you can see here is that you have some sort of positive correlation across the 24 hours of the day between price and demand. The one between price and wind, it seems to be really close to zero on this scenario here, but the nice feature is coming up when you look at the solar. For example, the solar against the wind, so the part of this green line here, or the solar against so against the wind, that is the blue, sorry, and the solar against the, uh, the demand, that is the, the green there, we can see that you have some sort of strange movements around, and they're not getting, they're not so close to zero, but they're getting negative, and we have some sort of increase near the end of the day, for example. And the fact is that what we are looking here is just off the peak hours from 8 a.m. In, in the morning until 4 p.m. in the afternoon, because the solar, as you remember from the first plot, is not so much interesting in the, in the tail part there. So that's mainly one of the, of the, of the part. And what we are confirming is that, uh, the, that there is a strong importance of the renewable energy sources inside, inside all the analysis and a sort of uh, negative or negative correlation between the solar and, and, and the wind during the central hours there. And that's a sort of negative correlation between prices and solar generation there. And on the other way around, we are also able to see how it's varying through time, this correlation. So how it's changing through all the, the sample size. So this one is how the correlation, so this top part here is the correlation between price and wind. The last one is the correlation between price and solar. And the bottom is the correlation between demand and solar there. So this one is how it's changing through time. So it should be take care that, for example, is there is a really huge jump around 2018, for example, between the correlation between demand and solar at 4 p.m. So that, that's maybe the point. So how it's changing through, through time, this, this sort of, of, of correlation there. And just a really final slide, and I think is one of really interesting studies that we were having with uh, Francesco and Claudia, is the, and it's really 
close to what is happening nowadays within the Russian-Ukrainian war and this turmoil movement of the energy prices is the fact that until now we saw that electricity prices are influenced by rents, but they are also influenced by other variables as well. It can be influenced by macroeconomic variable in industrial production index can influence or not the forecasting of electricity prices. But the issue is the fact that macroeconomic variable, as you may know, are available only at low frequency, quarterly, yearly, or monthly. But it's really it's really hard to have it them at daily perspective. While electricity prices we have seen until now that they're available at hourly or daily way around. So what we are seeing it, what we do it, we use a sort of Midas model, so mixing frequency. So we try to merge the difference in frequency between daily, so high frequency, and low frequency, quarterly or monthly macroeconomic variable. And so what we use is a sort of rest, reverse unrestricted Midas models. So we try to forecast uh, electricity prices, daily electricity prices, by using some sort of hard and soft information that are monthly industrial production index or monthly survey made it from the purchase managers index, the PMI index there. So that's all. And I would like just to conclude, and I hope to be on time within this last slide. This is just like a summary. So if you have listened until now, the first three dots are just summaries what we have seen until now. So the importance of including time bearing volatility, the fact that we are working with really high dimensional TBAR in the X part, we have seen that including renewable energy sources is really good and really important in order to forecasting. There is a strong interrelationship between rest, demand, and prices. And the other part, the last two itemized that you may see here is what or where we can go in the future is the following is, as you may see, the data set is stopped in 2019. But what's happening on, if you analyze the COVID-19 situation on the Russian Ukrainian war, that the prices is changing a lot. And that's the point that is entering this sort of outlier selection that we need to take care. So some sort of VAR within outliers there. And on the other way around is, is, important, is, is it possible or not to try to manage these hourly renewable energy sources in a sort of mixing frequency behavior to understand if macro financial, macroeconomic or financial variable are also influencing the forecasting of the rest or of the of the electricity prices. So this one is a, a, a possible way that one can deal with. And on the other way around, it can be also interesting to look at this, some sort of impulse response function there. So how is changing the, the if a shock in electricity prices in changing or not the renewable energy sources and so on. And so, forth. so that's to to conclude the talk of today. So I would like to thank you for for the attention. These one are the part of the paper that I was presenting it. And if you have questions, feel free. And, uh, and thanks again for, for having me here. OK, questions from the floor? Please raise your hands and wait the microphone. So thank you, Luca, for the very nice presentation. Um, I have a couple of questions. The first one is more uh, methodological. And uh, I was wondering if you and your research group uh, was thinking about an extension of the previous model in a functional way in order to model in a smooth, um, I mean, smooth way the, the 24 hours be, uh, behavior of the electricity. And the second one is more related to uh, stationarity and non stationarity because um, I mean, I, I share with you the fact that I'm co authoring a paper with Angelica, and we spend a lot of time on this on how the filtering can be useful for electricity prices. Uh, and we notice a lot of heterogeneity across Europe uh, regarding this fact. So, data are stationary or not, and the role of noise in this kind of uh, uh, reason. Thank you. Okay. That's that's a good question. Both of them are good questions. So the first one, I can answer honestly, no, we were not looking at functional VAR. First of all, because I'm not an expert on that field, so I should study by my own, and it will take a lot of time, let's say it. And, uh, but I think it can be something interesting. Uh, we were discussing this morning with, with, uh, with Andrea on a different kind of paper on oil that was doing functional VAR, 
but it's not based on us. It was from from a, from from a different authors there. But it's something that it may be of interest. But honestly, I'm not an expert on on that side there, so I cannot say that you will have some really good result or not. So that I cannot say. On the second one, that's that's a really good question so related to stationarity or not stationarity. So the point is that what we decided to do with with Francesco uh, in particular and also with Angelica, it was let the data speak. So we didn't look at, I know that maybe someone you will just say no, that's not really correct, also you, and you are maybe you are right too. But the fact is that we decided to leave the data in the levels, do not work on them, and the only way to try to deal within the, uh, the, stationary, the stationary part, let's say, it tried to enter within the dummies part there. So that was the only point that we were dealing with. And I know that there is a strong literature on wavelet part or trying to do some sort of filtering in order to smooth or not, but we decided to not go inside that kind of literature. We follow uh, Raviv et al. and another paper. There is also Rafael Veron that is a, that is writing down thousands of paper there. And I'm I'm not here. I'm not an expert as he's an expert. So so that, that's the point. But the fact is that we decided since we since Francesca and I are born more as a macroeconometricians, we decided to let the data speak a little bit and see what's happening and we saw that we're not having any sort of problem there so we didn't do any sort of co-integration test and anything's there and the fact is that we we saw that using these and sorry if i'm going back but using this sort of dummies variable here can smooth a little bit not taking all out the station i'm not saying that within these dummies i'm pretty far away from having stationary time series no but your, a way of trying to deal within this sort of stationarity or no stationarity issues, we decided to have within time series. But that's also a strong debate in the literature using wavelet representation or using other sort of representation or filtering representation in order to have a stationary series that can happen. But on my small expertise, let's say, I think that also within the, the recent crisis, you may see you are it's really hard to model these sort of outliers. And within this sort of stationary, so wavelet representation, it's really hard. And it's for that reason that is warning a lot the literature that is dealing with, uh, try to do uh, some sort of outliers inside the rest of the model. So try to model and work within outliers. The VAR outliers to have the volatility model there. That's, that's the way that one is trying to deal with. And I think because you are missing a lot the, the sort of variation that you have in your data. But that, that's something that has been done in the literature, that's for sure. So thank you very much. Thank you very much for the for the nice presentation. I think it, I mean, it was really dense. Probably I still have to digest something uh, which are not completely clear. And one uh, Question, it's mostly a clarification question related to Italy. I mean, why is not why do we have the zero lower bound in Italy and we don't observe it? It's an empirical fact or it's some regulatory? It's uh, a regulatory, uh, regulatory uh, things there. Angelica okay. is more an expert than me on the data, but it's something that you, you cannot go in negative at all on Italian market. There. Okay. So that's, that's something that maybe you are more expert than me, for sure. Not you, but all the audience here. So I'm not the expert on the data far there. But there is a sort of regulatory that is putting that you cannot go lower zero on, on the Italian market there. While on Germany, you can go negative at all. You see you going also to minus 100. And also during the COVID period, wasn't even worse there. But on the other way around, on the other mark, also in Spain, I guess you can go negative at all. Um, but here nowadays in Italy, you don't have it that much of crisis. And there is a student of mine that is trying to explore a little bit on all European countries nowadays on the master but it's still at the beginning so we were not we're not able to to collect all the data there okay thanks and for uh, concerning yeah. the second question instead is a bit more uh, technical i mean i wonder there are many parameters i mean i didn't count how many parameters are in the model i wonder whether you have estimated also using some penalizing factor uh, or you have restricted the number of parameters to be estimated so that that's a good point so I, since it was too much technical, I was not so going inside, but since you're asking, that's, that's a really good point. So we were not using any sort of factor model here, neither penalized factor model. What we are using here, we have really huge parameters in the X part. So what we are using, we are using the uh, so-called global local shrinkage prior from a Bayesian perspective. So global local shrinkage prior, if you are frequentist, you can think it like a lasso, 
or something like that, that is shrinking the parameter. From a Bayesian perspective, it's a little bit more difficult, but in this way around, you are shrinking the number of parameters. So we are not doing some sort of pre-processing at the beginning, but we are going to be estimating them and see what are the most important parameters there. So we are estimating all of them. There is a really huge amount of parameters to be estimated, but the sort of global local shrinkage prior, like an Urshu prior, normal gamma prior, or so on and so forth, can allow you to work with this sort of high dimensionality because as the name say, they shrink the parameter to zero, the one that are not important, and the other one are the one that are remaining important. Thank you. Okay. Yeah. Uh, hi, thank you for for your presentations. Very very nice, uh, well presented. I have just one curiosity: how much does it take uh, to get estimation? How much does it take? How so, long does it uh, take? Sorry, to get the so estimation. That, that's a good point. We have it on the paper nowadays. I'm I'm not able to remember at all. So let's say if you start increasing the number of parameters, but if you look, if you use some global local shrinkage prior there, the estimation is not taking. Well, it's taking sometimes, not as a frequent is one because you need to run more iteration in order to fulfill all the density there. More than, more than 24 hours. No, no, less than 24 hours. Okay. We are speaking about, well, if you start having this constant volatility, it's even less. If you start increasing an average stochastic volatility, it's a little bit bigger, let's say, but uh, it's, I think it's less than, it's even less than one hour, let's say. And currently, what we are dealing here nowadays but is, is, is behind what you can also use some sort of variational base in order to even pre improve the the, 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 the the speed of convergence of the algorithm there. It's taking less than 24 hours for sure because the starting of the project was asked from a from a from a company and they were needed to have them in a really good way around. And taking 24 hours, you cannot sell it at all. Also, in a in a researcher point of view, if I'm taking 24 hours for forecasting tomorrow, that's not a matter because how can I use it? What I'm forecasting tomorrow, if I cannot see what what's happening there. Okay, okay. thank you. But in the paper, in in the OBS paper, uh, in a, in a, there is there is the computational part. Maybe it's not inside the paper. It's just like a footnote, or in the supplementary material we have. Uh, it's in this in the second paper here, we have inside the, the the timing that is taking for estimating of the model. In, it was it was in the paper at the beginning, but nowadays it's in the online supplementary material. That's for sure. Okay. Yeah, just just a quick question. More, I mean, some uh, speculation about what can be done with this uh, approach. Are you planning, by the way, to study with this approach also capacity market, all the issue of, uh, I mean, intermittency of renewable, how to deal with it? Because I think, I mean, this can be particularly useful also to quantify the cost uh, of intermittency. There are studies, you know, that did this, you know. In a, so we, in we the US so and, no, that, that, that's a good point. So that, let's say this one was a starting point. And nowadays, well, it's not only my research field, this one. So there is different kind of research field that, I, that I'm working with. So we are not stop. We are working in the same direction, but we didn't go in the direction of the capacity. So maybe it's something that it can be of interest. But because what, one of the points, when, I mean, also when you teach, I mean, why we should switch to renewable or not? No? So yeah. the, the cost per hour per megawatt is lower for several renewable, but there is yeah. this problem. There are studies that, you know, that shows this uh, in the US. That there is this problem of uh, the extra cost that you have to, for every megawatt of installation of renewable, you need at least yeah. half. I mean, I just give yeah, 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 yeah. That's, that's uh, of, uh, of installation of you know, uh, gas, uh, turbine, and stuff like that to, you know, uh, for, for this reason. So actually, I think that this approach can be extremely useful to understand also this side of the market, you know. And, uh, no, no, that, that, and that's a good point. So and, I mean, for future no, no, that, that, that's a good point. So I will take I will take care of it. So so thanks a lot. Okay, so if there are no more questions, we stop here. Thank you, Luca. Okay, thank you again. Thank you.